well, both of us uh, have kind of perspectives that are kind of hard to place ideologically. So this is actually something that I've been meaning to ask you about. I'm kind of glad that I have it in conversation so other people can hear it too, because I think others might be interested in it. From what I know about your work, there's, there's actually an interesting um, set of uh, almost left wing uh, kind of intuitions. Although right now you're kind of popular among people who kind of lean more to the right, I think it's fair to say. So I'm curious if you could, if you, if you want to reflect on that a little bit more. So what I have in mind in particular, I mean, you probably have a sense of what I'm, what I have in mind, but I mean, I could give a few examples, but one to kind of just provoke the conversation is um, reading the mating mind. It's interesting how I found it very interesting that in, in sort of the introductory section, there's a kind of feminist gloss to it. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with the, for those listeners who aren't familiar with the book or, or the idea, you know, this is your, one of your first books, right. That, uh, kind of puts on the map, this idea of sexual selection, which goes back to Darwin, but is kind of underplayed historically. And you're kind of in that book, the mating mind, trying to really put that on the map. And, uh, the basic idea of sexual selection actually gives a lot of power to women. Cause it's basically the idea is that, um, uh, men have to engage in creative uh, activities and displays of intelligence to win over, you know, uh, females. Uh, and this in Darwin's time was actually seen as an affront to kind of macho masculinist patriarchal assumptions about, you know, men having, men having the power and being seen as kind of the, the power holders, whereas sexual selection implicitly gives a lot of power to women. Uh, so I just, I thought that was very interesting because that's a very kind of feminist implication. Uh, and yet, a lot of your thinking for some reason draws the, the, the more right-wing crowd. So I'm just curious if you could reflect on how those two things uh, how can be reconciled. Yeah. I, I mean, ideologically and politically, I'm extremely confusing to almost everybody because I've got this patchwork quilt of different beliefs that to me make complete rational sense, but I don't have any of the desire to appear ideologically coherent that most people seem to have. Like, I just don't care about looking leftist or, or rightist or centrist. I just go wherever my sort of conscience and the data and my personality quirks take me. So yeah, Darwin with sexual selection, that history is fascinating because to me, Darwin's um, great idea, his truly unique and original idea was sexual selection through mate choice. Evolution by natural selection, Darwin discovered, but, you know, Alfred Wallace co-discovered it about the same time. If Darwin hadn't talked about natural selection, other biologists would have within 10 years. It was in the zeitgeist. People were looking for a mechanism to explain adaptation and evolution. But what Darwin did was he kind of psychologized biology. He realized animal nervous systems have a causal influence on what evolves, particularly in mate choice. If the females prefer a certain trait like a peacock's tail, the peacock's tail will evolve to get larger, more colorful, more symmetric, more impressive. There's nothing the males can do about it. They're compelled by female choice. In our species, we have mutual choice. We have both males and females being choosy. So male desires for women to be intelligent, creative, artistic, musical, funny, are just as important as female desires for males to have those traits. Okay. Right. And human nature to me is a sort of interweaving of male ornamentation that females preferred and vice versa. Okay. Right. And there's a lot of overlap there. Mm. So, um, you know, I like a woman with a great sense of humor, which is one reason I'm with Diana Fleischman. She likes mm -hmm. a guy with a great sense of humor. Um, you know, that's how it plays out. But Darwin's contemporaries hated the idea. They hated it with a passion. The idea that evolution could be driven by the what they considered the capricious choice of females was was outrageous. And, and, you know, they didn't trust it. They didn't like it. And for a century after Darwin, biologists didn't really take sexual selection through mate choice very seriously. Um, so, yeah, in Mating Mind, my first book in 2000, I sort of emphasize that that Darwinian theory puts female brains in the driver's seats in terms of evolutionary progress. Okay. So, um, so you're actually saying that in human species, it's, it's symmetrical in terms of the, 
the male and female um, yeah. effect on that. Okay. Because yeah. it seems for, to me... For, for most species, it's the females driving it. But in a, in a relatively monogamous species like ours with mutual choice, then it's both sexes driving it. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So in, in today's uh, situation, sort of contemporary Western society, however, there are certain asymmetries, is it fair to say, in which um, women actually have a little bit more power in some sense over these. Is that fair to say? Um, just because of the current distribution of kind of cultural power. I don't know what it's due to. I mean, in, in mating mind, I did point out, you know, men and women both will value something like a sense of humor or artistic skill, but the ways that males and females might display it will be a little different because the sexual incentives are different. Right. So for example, if you're a young male and you've got, let's say musical talent, um, you might be highly motivated to, you know, join a band, perform in public, attract a lot of groupies, and kind of get the, the public sexual benefits of, of doing that in this sort of high-risk public way. Whereas if you're a woman with equal musical skill and creativity, your sexual payoffs for doing that just aren't as big. What are you going to do with a thousand male groupies? Right. right. It, it, it just doesn't make sense in terms of your, re, your reproductive incentives right. to sort of attract all the possible males you can get the way that it makes sense for male to attract all the possible females. Right. So there's going to be the strategic difference. And that means basically males will do more high risk public broadcasting okay. of their skills. Women will tend to do more kind of private narrow casting. Like they might you know, come up with an amazing set of songs, but sort, sort of perform it just for their their boyfriends and their little group of friends. Um, now, wonderfully, once you get a key innovation um, in culture, then suddenly the incentives for women can change. And the key innovation is bodyguards. Hmm. Once you had a situation in the 80s when female pop stars could just hire enough muscle to keep male sexual harassment at bay, then you suddenly get the incentives to become rich and famous and broadcast your, your, your musical genius to the world. Wow. Okay. Females have an incentive to do that. Yeah. Right. Um, it's not necessarily as much a sexual incentive, but it's like a cultural and status and prestige incentive and a monetary incentive. Wow. So basically once, once women are empowered by, you know, being able to get physical protection so they can avoid harassment and rape, that unleashes a huge amount of female creativity in society. That's and, fascinating. And, and I think you saw that with the, you know, uh, the first really successful generation of female singer-songwriters like um, Tori Amos, PJ Harvey, Bjork in the, in the early 90s. I think they were really the beneficiaries of that kind of cultural change. Okay, that's fascinating. But so is that to say that at some point in the early 90s, there was a significant increase in kind of bodyguarding capacity. What was that sort of cause then? I, well, I'm being a little bit facetious. I don't think it was strictly just like bodyguards, but I think um, obviously there's a, there's a critical mass effect where once the record companies realize, oh, there's a market, yeah, then they will invest enough money in you know, the studio time and the touring and um, supporting the, the artists who are female. Um, huh. And I, I'm not an expert on pop music, but I think, you know, there was a combination of lower risk of sexual harassment, increased monetary rewards, um, and a kind of cultural shift that says, yeah, women can do amazing work. Um, right. Whereas before they were just sort of eye candy and pop stars. And I mean, you know, what's a pretty crazy hypothesis is that because the early nineties is also the first big wave of political correctness. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense you could, you could arguably think of that as a kind of cultural bodyguarding, you know, it's this kind of like cultural, um, moral mm -hmm. fortress yeah. that is maybe doing some of the, some kind of bodyguarding function. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so, you know, when I went to college in the mid-80s, um, that was sort of the first wave of 
political correctness and postmodern theory and gender feminism really kind of getting its teeth into into culture and influencing how people thought about uh, issues like sexual harassment. And suddenly it became really uncool to act in certain ways. And I think that did provide a kind of protective cultural buffer for um, that generation of, of female geniuses to be able to do their thing. Mm -hmm. um, and to be protected not just by female fans, but also male fans. Um, and also, no doubt, there were shifts you know, within the, the music industry that meant if you're a record producer, it's no longer cool to kind of harass your, your female uh, <laughs> stars the same way that it would have been, let's say, in the, in the 60s. That's interesting. Okay. So, and what about the kind of contemporary trend in which women are starting to do better in, in schooling and th things of this nature? Does that have interesting effects on selection, sexual selection, or any of these things that you're talking about? Yeah, it's really weird that, so in the U.S. now, about 60% of college students are female. And that means 1.5 women for every uh, man in college. On the one hand, that's great because it means women are succeeding in high school. They're getting better grades. They're they're getting into good schools. They're serious about their studies. I don't know what the hell the young men are doing. Um, lots of video games, I guess. But that creates this weird sex ratio imbalance in colleges where although the women are doing better and they're empowered academically, they're not empowered in terms of like their bargaining power mm -hmm. in their mating market because there aren't enough men to go around if they're straight, there aren't enough men. So the men have all the bargaining power in colleges and that usually ends up meaning the men aren't getting into relationships. They want more casual sex. Um, and they tend to exploit that. So college campuses are operating in a very weird way now in terms of how, how they, how they work as mating markets. Yeah, that's very fascinating. I'm, I'm just kind of reflecting uh, on how that may or may not play a role in kind of the, the new wave of kind of campus activism and, you know, what people call sort of SJW politics. Because in some ways that can be read as uh, a, a kind of wave of uh, female power, or at least, I mean, that's, that's like, that's how, how, for instance, Jordan Peterson reads it. Um, and that's, intuitive to see it that way, but it's interesting to put that against what you're saying about how actually female bargaining power is uh, not so hot in, in sexual terms, at least. Yeah. I think it also has a lot to do with just um, time allocation, I guess. Like when I was in college, I basically spent all my time either studying, going to class or being in medium term relationships. Um, I guess people are still studying, but if they're not in relationships, that leaves a whole lot of time for whatever else they do um, from sports to sort of, you know, grievance based protests. And, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily claim social justice activists are just compensating for like not having mates. That's too simplistic, but right. it is striking that, you know, there's a lot of energy and frustration and, and outrage at the system that um, you know, just didn't exist in the 80s. And I don't think things are that much worse. Mm. So, you know, I would love to see a sort of analysis of how students are actually allocating their time and mm -hmm. energy now mm. versus 20 or 30 years ago. That's a good point. That's in, that, and you're right. That's an interesting question, and I don't know the data on that. But it seems to me plausible that it seems plausible that uh, work expectations have decreased, like standards have have decreased. I think because you see things like grade inflation, and I think just with the 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 massification of higher education and just mm -hmm. the sheer increasing numbers of people um, that go into higher education, um, I think that also has been associated with a certain relaxation of of expectations and how you should be spending your time. So I think that, I mean, my intuitive, completely anecdotal sense is that the contemporary university student spends very little time uh, really working on, on academics. Um, that could be wrong. I'm yeah. I, I, that's sort of my impression as well. I mean, I've taught in higher education for 25 years now and I've been at all different 
kinds of universities with different admission standards and different expectations. But I've never been in a place where students regularly worked as hard as they did at um, Columbia, where I did undergrad, you know, where it was sort of like, okay, you read Thucydides, all of Thucydides for Thursday, next Tuesday, you got to read all of Homer. Um, I just don't see students doing that level of work. Yeah. So I wonder if it's a phenomenon in which as the academic standards have been relaxed, it frees up time and energy that these students have to find some outlet for, <laughs> for using. And also they need other mechanisms for kind of like selecting and compete, competing and selecting each other. And so they have to kind of fabricate uh, kind of absurd, like cultural politics games. Yeah. Well, they seem to spend a lot of time thinking about their identity and who they are and what it means and how they identify. And, you know, back in the day, it was more about, well, we identify through basically, you know, the music we associate with, the, the, the way we dress, the little subcultures, largely consumerist subcultures that we would kind of get into. And we would think we'd be terribly rebellious if we were like punks versus, you know, new wave people versus preppies. And so it was all about these sort of accoutrements and, and um, lifestyle choices. It wasn't really about, oh, I identify with this political group and ideology, and I'm going to assert that publicly and, and fight for my rights. You know, you don't you don't have the new the new romantics of the early 80s, like asserting their rights as new romantics. Right. Right. You know, like Susie and the Banshee Banshees taught us how to uh, to be and we're going to politicize that. That just didn't happen. Right. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so what about also, I'm curious to know a little bit more about what you think about capitalism in particular, because uh, we've sort of talked about this before, but we never got into it too deeply. So I, I, I was curious, like your book spent where, you know, you're, you're really interested in a lot of the ways that capitalism really kind of fucks with psychology in, you know, less than desirable ways, you might say. Um, so I'm curious if, if that perspective uh, makes you perhaps like, yeah, I'm just curious how you see capitalism in, in, in that respect. Yeah. So in terms of my weird patchwork ideology, you know, my first book, The Mating Mind, was sort of me planting my flag with, with Darwinian feminism saying female mate choice drives most of, of biology. My, my spent book from 2008 was basically a Darwinian critique of consumerist capitalism. Right. And it was pointing out, you know, here's how the human mind works. Here are the motives that drive us, the, the ways that we want to display certain traits that we have, like how do we display our intelligence or openness or agreeableness or, or conscientiousness, all these well-studied psychological traits. And my idea was uh, marketing and advertising are very good at giving us kind of tools for doing that. And all the lifestyle marketing that we have is, basically offering to consumers, hey, if you buy this good or service, it will be really effective at displaying your higher than average intelligence or your higher than average kindness and agreeableness and concern about others and the environment and so forth. And we are just suckers for that. Marketing does it. We buy it. We um, spend a huge amount of time and energy you know, working and shopping, and, and it's all kind of in the service of displaying these traits to each other. And I point out in Spent, often you could display exactly those same traits for free, quickly, through face-to-face -face interaction with people and just talking to them, and you don't have to buy this all, all this shit. So it was really a very deeply anti-consumerist book. Um, but of course, it was totally ignored by the left, and what I did get calls about was calls from marketers and big companies saying, help <laughs> us use this and weaponize it to sell stuff even better. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. Because I, I hear that. Um, I hear those ideas. And I'm really interested in, like, how, did, how does this give us an edge in uh, transforming how we relate to, uh, you know, the socius and, 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 and the economy <clears throat> and these, like, large-scale kind of economic structures that condition us so deeply 
in ways that I think are horrifying and that a lot of people, you know, find horrifying and that the left is largely uh, organized around a kind of an, op- an opposition to um, how. So let me be the person who asks you that, like, how would you uh, kind of translate those insights into, um, you know, transformative uh, potential if you if, if you if you would? Well, I mean, when I talk to people about this, I kind of tr- try to titrate my advice to you know, wherever they're at in life. But one thing I remind young people about is the power of just informal conversation to get to know somebody and that you don't have to, you know, wrap yourself up like a package in consumerism in order to convey who you are. And I try to remind people, you know, what are the fundamental Darwinian goals of life? Like survive and reproduce and parent and, uh, you know, find yourself a good, happy tribe that you enjoy if you can do that with minimal amounts of work and minimal amounts of shopping uh that's a win and so it i'm basically just reminding people just go after the fundamental goals that you might have like if your goal is find a mate and have three kids figure out the easiest way to do that you know given the society you live in rather than um, assuming that, oh, that means, oh, crap, I have to go to college and then get this kind of job and then you can go into this amount of consumer debt and, you know, student debt and worry about my career. No, you don't necessarily have to do that. Right. At the level of kind of overturning consumerist capitalism, <laughs> um, we keep doing it every generation anyway, right? For example... In the 90s, there was a lot more emphasis on just going big, like with Hummers and SUVs and big houses, McMansions, and a lot of spending on literally material goods. And then we got the internet, and we got smartphones, and we got social media. And now people have kind of dematerialized the way that they get status, Mm. right? You don't get status through your, you know, the size of your sports utility vehicle, you got status for things like how many Twitter followers do you have or, you know, views on YouTube or uh-huh. what do you consume on Netflix? Uh, it's, it's all electronic now, which from my point of view is kind of cool because it's less of a footprint ecologically. It means there's actually broader access to the means of status Mm-hmm. where you don't actually need that much money, you know, to be a, a YouTube star. Right. So, okay. So here's an interesting question then. How do you explain the rise of, you know, what people call virtue signaling when that's, it's actually super not creative. <laughs> that's kind of paradoxical, isn't it? Like, wouldn't you expect to find, uh, you know, with the opening up of communication platforms into this sort of new digital, uh, really open decentralized realm uh, wouldn't you, wouldn't you kind of expect a uh, flourishing of creativity and yet there's actually a kind of flourishing of kind of markedly non-creative, like slogan repeating? Yeah, that's a good point. I never really thought about it. So if, like, if you're a young aspiring musician, you want novelty, you want creativity, you want to make sounds with your, your trap music or dubstep or whatever whatever you're doing that nobody's heard before and you want to put it together and if you if you're accused of being you know derivative and imitative that's really embarrassing whereas in the virtue signaling realm being creative is such a handicap like if you say i don't care about all that shit you people care about i don't care about global warming i don't care about global poverty what i care about is let's say the existential risk to humanity from artificial intelligence. Most people will go, what <laughs> the fuck? What, what even is that? Is that yeah. virtue signaling or is that just uh, mental illness? They, <laughs> so virtue signaling only works because we have moral norms that large numbers of, of people kind of agree to. And you basically want to signal that I, I buy into your your ethical narrative about what's important, right. not just what's important, but I also buy into your narrative about 
how value A connects to values B and C. So for example, if you're anti-racist, you're also supposed to be anti-sexist and uh, anti-fascist and you know anti-capitalist. And if you're the opposite of any of those, like you're really into guns, you're also supposed to really be into God and you know the nation and your race and whatever. So virtue signaling locks people into this extremely impoverished um, set of signals and, and ways of being, ways of advertising. I'm in your tribe, your moral tribe. And to me, that is just so tedious. Yeah, for sure. But isn't it's kind of a paradox as to how it persists when actually based on kind of the stuff we're talking about um, and how people select each other, there's actually a lot of incentive to defect. And it should, in principle, be very attractive if you defect in creative ways, in risk-taking creative ways. And I think it is. Um, I think that does actually occur. Um, I think it is attractive and it actually is rewarded but people are too afraid to do it or something like that. But that's, I think one of the interesting insights of, uh, you know, cause we're talking about before I was asking you like, what are, what are kind of the, the, what's the uptake of this for, or the upshot of this for, you know, actually having leverage over transforming the world. Right. And one of one might be that you actually have a, a strong kind of theoretical and empirical grasp of when it is rational and will be effective to take certain risks. Yeah. Um, and I think this, this is maybe, maybe a good one. Like if you actually have the courage to, uh, not just conform to this kind of mindless virtue signaling, you will be appreciated. There will be people who will be attracted to it. There will, it's sort of irresistible when people creatively kind of stake themselves on their independent perspective. Um, it's hugely rewarding. And I feel like the more this kind of SJW bubble grows, the more incentives there will be for people to just say, fuck it. I'm going to say whatever I actually feel, whatever I actually think. And it's totally messy, risky, dangerous form. I'm just going to put it all out there because that's so fucking attractive when, when people actually do it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I feel like when you take these sorts of theories and, and sort of the, the strong empirical basis for this being how people function, when you really kind of see that you're like that it's real empowerment to actually take those risks. Um, because you trust that, that the world is going to kind of respond favorably in the end. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I think you're right that these things can be rewarded, but, and, and, you know, with the internet and social media, it's a lot easier to find little, little sub tribes that mm -hmm. do appreciate any, any given perspective. Um, so in a week, for example, I'll go to the effective altruism global conference in Berkeley, and it's a meeting of a couple thousand people who are into this effective altruism movement. Mm -hmm. And I totally buy into it and believe what they care about but it's also tribal in that it's a it's a group of very high iq people who are willing to take moral positions that are extremely unconventional um and when they find other people who are like them that's super exciting and they love it and they you know get together and talk about it endlessly but most people i don't know don't have the guts or the imagination to do that I think another problem is intersectionality, though. If your virtue signaling is basically like, I identify with this list of attributes that are descriptions of me as a person, right? Like I'm, you know, a black Muslim trans woman from this place, uh, whatever it is. Well, you can chop those as fine grained as you want. You can keep adding more and more descriptions of yourself and sort of presenting that as like, I, I get extra grievance points, you know, the longer my list of identities is. Oppression Olympics. Sometimes yeah. Oppression called. Olympics. But the, the problem with that is nobody can argue with you over the, you know, the factual or ethical basis of your identity. If it's nothing more than a description of who you are, rather than a description of things you care about, there's no conversation to be had. Whereas when I introduce myself to people, it's usually about what I am interested in, what I care about, and what I think is ethically important. And then we can have a discussion, right? If I just say, well, I'm a white, middle-aged male from the Midwest, then what do you do with that? You know, either say, yep, <laughs> you sure are, or nope. And yeah. 
so I think the intersectional identity thing is is it's a terrible way to do virtue signaling mm. because it doesn't lead to any productive rational conversations. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Like a lot of people associate intersectionality with virtue signaling, but in a sense you're saying uh, intersectionality actually prevents a real like effective virtuous signaling from happening yeah. because there's so little you're able to actually <laughs> cre- creatively yeah. signal. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the end of a conversation rather than the yeah, beginning. Right. Um, that's interesting. So going back a little bit to this question of um, the significance of these psychological insights for um, potentially radical kind of politics Because, you know, I think a lot of people who have been kind of following the stuff I've been writing and putting out lately think that I've kind of like defected from the left or something completely or whatever. And it's really not true. It's just I've sort of like um, I've set sail from any kind of like uh, externally defined expectation of what I'm supposed to say or think. Um, And so from a certain perspective, that looks some people kind of to some people, it kind of looks like I'm like joined the alt right or something like that. And it's, it's genuinely not the case. Like I'm still genuinely deeply interested in um, how people can uh, foment significant social and political change towards, you know, what like the left wing would call collective liberation or something like this. Um, So because I'm still interested in that, I kind of want to kind of run something by you uh, and and just hear what you, what you think about it. Cause listening to the more I get into psychology uh, and a lot of the kinds of things that you're interested in that you study, the more I see real um, edges to be had for people who want to kind of really get smart about how society functions um, and people who want to get serious about really kind of transforming the nature of, of culture and, and of society at large, I see a lot of potential edges in which these lessons could, if taken seriously by even small communities of people and really kind of applied radically, um, could very feasibly and and with kind of empirical um, seriousness lead to uh, highly desirable kind of macro level changes. Um, and I just wonder if, if you agree with that or if you have any kind of thoughts on how that might play out or if you think I'm, I'm just kind of uh, fantasizing because like things like the, the consumer capitalism critique that you uh, <clears throat> laid out just a minute ago, all of those are ex- powerful examples of how like most people under capitalism have like all of their kind of re- reward systems like hijacked basically. Mm-hmm. And they're examples of extraordinary kind of waste and inefficiency and how like most people um, under capitalism are being kind of channeled by these like large scale institutions that they have no awareness of in ways that are like ultimately quite destructive for them. So my, my thinking, the basic intuition is that like if you get even a small group of people, like 10 people, radical mm-hmm. folks who are really interested in overthrowing capitalism, let's say, and they actually got together and they're like, okay, let's bone up on all of these ways in which capitalism like fucks most people, but not just oppresses them, actually makes them behave in ways that are suboptimal for their own kind of agency and for their creative kind of potency uh, to affect other people. And we just update all of our attitudes and behaviors to be optimal according to everything we know about how humans function. My hypo- my, I really strongly hypothesize that if you get even a small group of people who were to do that and really commit to it radically, mm-hmm. that would be an extremely dangerous and potent uh, force of, 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 of even, even from just a small group of people. Um, and I wonder if that resonates with you at all or if you have anything you want to kind of add to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, where I think the left went wrong sometime around, I don't know, 1848 or something is the focus on money and economics and the material conditions of society and work and spending. To Darwinian, that's not really where the action is. To us, genes and reproduction and parenting are where the action is. And I see the world first as a mating market and only secondarily as as an economy. Now, whenever you confront an economic issue, and people are arguing about it in a way that you don't understand and seems economically rational, I found it often helps to put on your Darwinian glasses and think, what's really happening at the mating market level Hmm. here? And that usually resolves a lot of issues where you can get insights into how are people doing their sexual competition? How are they doing their courtship? How are they, you know, choosing mates? Uh, 
uh, how are they parenting? How many kids are they having? What's the inner birth intervals? Can they afford to have a house? Can you know how much parenting help and support can they get? So to me, that usually cuts through a lot of, of bullshit, and it also alerts you to you know, how are the par- powers that be kind of taking the mating effort and the parenting effort that we all expand and kind of shaping them in directions that are against our interests, mm. right? Parenting effort, for example, we all want the best for our kids. Because in prehistory, it was hard to get the best for our kids. We really had to work to hunt and gather and protect them and give them enough food that they actually like you know grew and mm-hmm. survived and didn't get eaten by saber tooth cats. Nowadays it's not that hard to provide an environment that's good enough for most kids to thrive pretty well according to the behavior genetics. Like family environment doesn't matter that much in western societies. Once the kids have the basics. Once right? the kids have yeah. the basics. Once you're not locking them in a closet and starving them. Right. But what happens is um, there are all these industries around parenting, right? All the way from baby Einstein toys that supposedly make your kids smarter to um, private, you know, Ivy League colleges that convince parents you must spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on your kid or else your kid will fail. So that's an example of, you know, consumerist businesses kind of leveraging that parental ambition and guilt, not in the interests of the parents or their kids, but just to get you to spend extra money. And I think the same happens with courtship in in so many ways. So I think if you just pay attention to what's happening at the mating and parenting level, at the genetic level, um, rather than trying to figure out, you know, do we have equal pay and should we have a minimum wage and you know, is housing getting more or less affordable? What's the optimal immigration level? I think those economic issues are downstream from the Darwinian issues. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, do you do you have any thoughts you want to share on sort of the the implications of declining fertility rates? Are you interested in that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a huge problem in Europe. America is about at replacement level in terms of sort of a couple of kids per per woman on average. Europe is not doing that very effectively. It's sort of between one and two kids, depending on the country. And I think it's a huge problem. And it's an indictment of the economic system that there's all this apparent prosperity and the economy is allegedly growing. But a lot of parents or wannabe parents think, I can't afford to have the size of family I want. Housing in Britain is just too expensive. I can't do it. And that's terrible. This is the first time in human history, I think, that that's been the case, that most people couldn't have as many kids as you know they wanted just because of well, mostly bad housing policies, but overcrowding and, and so forth. So That's interesting. So you chalk it up to um, financial issues, in particular housing. Mm-hmm. People feel like they don't have the security, the financial security to have kids? The security and the, the, the literal physical space. Oh, okay. I mean, you tend to see bigger families like in the, the American Midwest where the, the houses are simply bigger than a typical, you know, British uh, row house or semi-detached. That's interesting, but it it's kind of inconsistent with the image we have of, you know, like early 20th century uh, folks who had lots of kids in tiny tenements, right? So... I wonder if there's something else going on that's behind it. Well, there was that weird period from basically the early 1800s to the the mid 1900s when you had these packed tenements and it's sort of all, you know, urban ghettos and all the major uh, urban areas. But before that, um, when most people were living rurally, you had more space and you also crucially, you know, every living room in the village was potentially a place you could visit. Right. You had um, co-dads and co-moms. You knew people. You had gran- grandparents nearby. Uh, it wasn't just isolated nuclear family housing. The whole village was your playground. So I think that's another um, key change. Do you, do you think that there's a kind of attitudinal 
dimension um, it, at play in which something a little screwy is going on with people's attitudes towards kids. Um, because it seems to me that like if, if those tiny tenements, you know, in the early 20th century didn't keep poor folks from having kids, yeah. uh, there's something kind of unsatisfying about the space constraint being, being the sole explanation. It definitely makes sense that it, it would be one. Um, but it seems to me like there's also something going on. There's something in the air and this is very anecdotal. I'm totally painting with a broad brush. Um, but it seems to me there's like a weird, um, kind of anti-child attitude. I don't think it's a very widespread, but I think it's widespread enough, especially among young people that I find it. I mean, I find it very peculiar and kind of, uh, frightening. Uh, it's like, there seems to be among a non-trivial contingent of, uh, young adults, um, a weirdly kind of, uh, proud almost, um, uh, rejection of, of the, the, even the idea of kids and, and having kids. Uh, there's a certain like cultural capital from being anti-kid. Um, and it seems, I wonder if you have a read on that. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. There's this latent antinatalism that having kids is bad. And that right. if you're a parent, you're somehow actually defecting on the species right. in a weird way. Yeah. Like, what do you think about that? It's, it's bizarre to me because, you know, like my mom came from a family of 12 kids and I'm used to the idea of very big families being achievable. I think there's a combination of sort of 70s um, pessimistic environmentalism that says overpopulation is a massive problem. It would be selfish to have more kids because it'll hurt the planet. And now that's turned into, oh, look at the carbon footprint of every kid. If you want to reduce your carbon footprint, the most important thing, don't have a kid. So there's the global environmental guilt. There's also, you know, the two career couple issue that um, it used to be you could afford to raise a family if just one parent was working. Now you can't do that again because of this money and space issue. And well, of course, contraception is also huge. You can control your fertility much more easily. And I think, I mean, part of it is a kind of virtue signaling that why are you only helping this tiny number of you know kids of your own when you should be helping society as a whole? There's a kind of moral burden that's placed on everybody that you have to justify your existence in terms of what you give to society at large and that having kids is defecting on that social contract. Mm. I mean, I kind of, yeah, I think that's all very astute. Um, I wonder also if there's a sort of... Uh, a causal factor at work that's basically kind of just like the long run rise of modern nihilism. You know, I mean, I'm inclined to see this sort of in a Nietzschean way. And I think that, uh, you know, after the death of God, as it were, <clears throat> people really, I mean, it's, I think Nietzsche's, uh, you know, warnings were like very, should be taken like quite seriously and literally. I mean, people often think of Nietzsche as just like a, yeah, interesting radical thinker, but um, kind of pie in the sky. Yeah. kind of crazy guy. Yeah. But I think like it's, it's, it's extremely real and concrete that, you know, it's, it's not at all clear that humans know how to live or have any reason to live after something like the death of God. And I think, I think you're really kind of seeing the implications of it. Um, I think like young people coming up today, a lot of them genuinely, like they don't feel any reason or they don't see any reason why they should want to uh, continue <laughs> the species. Like they have no drive for it and they look around and they can't find any drive for it. Um, and I, and I, I, I'm inclined to diagnose that at least in part, um, as a kind of long run, uh, outcome of these kind of nihilistic dynamics. And again, this is kind of one of the, re this also feeds into why I'm interested in sort of the, why I'm still interested in the critique of capitalism because in a lot of ways, I think, um, it is the rise of modern capitalism, uh, and the explosion of kind of market relationships that really, uh, rapidly hollows out any sources of meaning in life other than, you know, exchange value and, 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 um, economic, economic power. I think like we're at a point where, um, you know, people are far more concerned about, you know, the, the value of their house than about any type of like intrinsic, um, purpose such as like, uh, you just, just live living for living sake or continuing life, you, you know, human life on the planet. Um, so yeah, I wonder if, uh, that's also at work. 
Yeah, never underestimate Nietzsche. I think, <laughs> uh, if nothing else, being the philosopher who takes seriously you know, the question, what the fuck's going to happen after religion dies and yes. everybody becomes an atheist? Right. Um, people didn't really think that through very well in the, in the 1800s. Um, Darwin thought it through, I think, quite mm. a bit. But, well, what do you have left? From my perspective as an evolutionary psychologist, you have a bunch of different uh, kind of instincts that can attach moral value and meaning to different domains of life. Mm. You still have courtship, love, and romance, right? People still seem to care about that, like mm -hmm. they care about their relationships, even mm -hmm. no matter how nihilistic they are. Um, if they're in a happy relationship with somebody who loves them, it's hard to be that nihilistic. They still get meaning from kids if they have kids, because it's just very difficult not to like your kids, you know. But I think what's happened now is that larger levels of, of, of societal organization We've been convinced by the powers that be that you're not supposed to take pride in any larger groups that you happen to be in, mm. um, or at least certain ones of them. Like taking pride in your city is kind of weird <laughs> nowadays. Like people yeah. sort of do it like, oh, I live Through in sports. London or versus Southampton or... And, and yeah, in America, taking pride in your city means like you have to take pride in your football team. Right. And if you don't care about football, why the hell do you care about your city as an identity? Um, taking pride in your country, right? That's nationalism. That's right. allegedly discredited. You can't do that. Um, <clears throat> taking pride in what? The European Union? That's just 350 million people you don't know. Right. It's hard to find meaning in that. And then taking pride in your species, even a lot of young people seem to think our species has been somehow discredited by yeah. environmental problems and global warming and being mean to other animals and all of that. So any new political movements that offer meaning at this level of organization between your little nuclear family and what the cosmos as a whole attracts people. It's very compelling. Right. Um, that could be religion. Like if, if, you know, if you're the young person from a Muslim family and you go through your period and your teens and twenties of like clubbing and short term relationships and having fun. And then it feels called kind of empty, right? Then you're ripe for radicalization. Mm -hmm. Right. Or if you go to college and you think, oh man, I'm not that good at college. I'm not. An excellent student, where do I get my meaning? I'll become a social justice activist and identify with a new gender or a, my race or whatever. Right. That is fascinating how it's like m so many uh, levels of like higher group identification are seen as taboo, but kind of like multicultural cosmopolitanism. It, it's seen, like a kind of vague identification with, right. you know, like. Uh, the the globe in some sense is good, but so that's odd. That's hot. That's interesting. Like I well, wonder course, why the, the right has a whole theory about why that is. Right, that it's it, it's just much easier for global mega corporations to exploit consumers if you strip away every possible form of consumer identity, other than the brands you like. Mm. Right. If you if you force people to be highly mobile in terms of where they work. If you force them to think every country is pretty much equivalent and interchangeable, um, if you if you convince them I should give up any sense of ethnic identity or pride in my ancestry, then they become a much more malleable consumer, and also they don't spend all their time doing all this weird tribal shit. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. All all they're left with is working and consuming. Right, and I mean that's definitely consistent also with like what I've written about. Um kind of the the unspoken role of education in kind of the culture wars today in, in that, you know, kind of gl global cosmopolitanism as a kind of cultural market uh, is kind of uh, like a playground that is disproportionately um, maneuverable by people with higher education. Um, and so it's like the one form of privilege that's like not criticized uh, because it's like the ticket or the token 
that gives you like uh, greater maneuverability within this like cultural politics game of of uh, of you know privileged politics or whatever. Yeah, I mean one one uh, <laughs> terribly oppressive you know side effect of denying IQ of the left denying intelligence as a useful construct is they can't talk about cognitive oppression. They can't talk about the way that high IQ people take advantage of low IQ people. Yes. Right? Not just in, in sort of obvious ways, like yes. making them do shitty jobs, but other things like making society unnecessarily confusing. It's so true. Or creating educational systems where instead of having reliable IQ tests at age 16 that, that are useful to employers... Uh, you you basically prohibit IQ tests and you make people get these educational credentials that are IQ proxies, but they cost them hundreds of thousands of more dollars and take extra years. And and that to me is just outright cognitive oppression. It's so true. And I think the reason why a lot of people in, in the left don't want to acknowledge that or can't, they're kind of structurally incapable of acknowledging it is because the SJW game is predicated on their like slight IQ advantage over like even uh, uh, poor and less privileged people. Yeah. Um, namely like, you know, the left behind like <clears throat> white masses, Yeah. you know, that like are Trump's base basically, at, at least yeah. that's sort of how I read it. So it's like they, I think a lot of sort of, you know, the SJW contingent uh, kind of knows and kind of believes that there are actually like real differences in cognitive capacity. Uh, between people and that they matter tremendously for who gets what and who wins what games in society. Um, and they know it because they're playing one themselves and, and they're, they are successfully defeating a significant contingent of people who are less able than them. Um, and yet it bars them from being able to critique the even smarter high IQ people who are totally dominating the economy and who are like hogging everything uh, to themselves and, and becoming even more and more aggressive uh, in in kind of hogging everything for themselves, so I think that's a it's a really really important point that the left uh, that you make that the left bars itself from being able to say, look, there are really really intelligent people who are aggressively organizing society in their image to their own benefit, and it's screwing over almost everyone else, and it's because they are actually more uh, capable in in some objective ways than the rest of us are. Um, so it's a, it's an extremely um, it's an extremely short-sighted um, refusal to to like admit uh, the significance of those objective differences. I think it it is, and you know, it, it's not like the whole world is doing it. I mean, China still believes in intelligence, and they mm. still believe in intelligence testing, and their whole society is increasingly a, a you know fiercely competitive cognitive meritocracy. Mm. But they're upfront about it at mm. least in America and Britain. We kind of know it's a cognitive meritocracy, like if you're bright, you get ahead, but we don't admit it well enough that, let's say, the bright kids from the working class, you know, have a, uh, have a chance to actually succeed. When we had standardized testing that worked, that was respectable and that had an impact on your life in the middle third of the 20th century, you had this huge influx of bright working class kids you know, going to uh, the grammar schools and getting into good universities and achieving leadership roles and becoming professionals and escaping, you know, uh, the coal mines, basically. And once you shut that down, once you get rid of the 11 plus, once you end standardized testing, it just reverts to a privilege based education system. Right. And I think the left was absolutely insane to to abandon that. Because, uh, you know, that was the way to escape. Of course, the, the, the cost of that was the brain drain from the working class, right? If you suck everybody who's bright from the working class into the middle class, who's going to organize your labor unions, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? The, you, you don't have socialists anymore if you don't have, you know, uppity, smart, disgruntled, working class people who, who know what's going on. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting point. Huh? Something you mentioned before was, uh, China. And I know that you're a kind of, it seems like you're a bit of a China watcher. Um, so I'd, I'd be here, I'd be curious to know, 
uh, some more about what you think about China as someone who watches it. I actually <clears throat> know very little about what's going on in China, so I'm quite ignorant on this front. Um, do you, it kind of seems like from stuff I've heard you say, and I think some of the things I've seen that you've written, you seem to kind of be in the camp who sees China as potentially uh, going to rise uh, to power uh, perhaps more rapidly than people think and kind of you, the, the Western uh, kind of cultural taboos that we have are going to paralyze us. Um, and, and that soon, like, are, are you of the persuasion that kind of global, you know, uh, technological society is going to be soon uh, a Chinese society? Yeah, I think the Middle Kingdom is going to dominate the world soon as it has done for most of the previous, you know, 3,000 years in terms of being kind of the center of civilization. For better or worse, I think that's going to happen. Um, I've just written a, a journal paper where I have a sort of alternative history of what would have happened in China if Mao hadn't won in 1946, if the Kuomintang mm -hmm. had won. Mm -hmm. What if China had developed from the 40s until now under a kind of leadership like uh, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, right? What if they had 8% growth from the 40s until now? Okay. They would basically have a $60 trillion economy. They would have about forty forty five thousand dollars $45,000 per person GDP. Um, they would have the best universities in the world. They would dominate science. Um, they would kind of dominate global culture. They're, they're, media, movie, TV industries would be much more important than Hollywood. And it's really just an accident of history that, that uh, Mao won. It could have gone differently. Mm. And then, you know, Mao kind of fucked up China's development for about 30, 35 years. And then when Deng Xiaoping took over in 1978, China started to catch up at its sort of natural rate of, of growth, given its talent and its capacity as a civilization. Yeah. So I think whenever I see, you know, Western news, American or European, British news, a lot of times I think, okay, and the Chinese, you know, Politburo and think tanks and, and you know, military strategy um, uh, rooms, how, how are they interpreting this? They, they must be looking at us and going, what the fuck are those people doing? What are they even doing? Have they not figured out how to run their society in a way that's sustainable and, and powerful and delivers to its people? And um, we must look absolutely insane. And they must be feeling like, uh, we're, the, you know, we're the psychiatrists who have to take over the asylum. That's fascinating. Um, do you follow like the military politics? A little bit, but I've read a few books about Chinese military strategy and the sort of history of it, the intellectual history of how they think about how to win mm. wars. And it's very, very different from the way Western mm. military strategists think, you know, the Chinese love to win wars without even fighting. Mm. They love to win economically. They love to win with asymmetric warfare if they can. And we're used to thinking, well, you just line up your soldiers and fire arrows at each other and, and then have cavalry charges and whoever wins, wins. That's not how they think about it. Right. And all of the traditional sources of power that the U.S. has, for example, like aircraft carrier groups, They've already been completely neutralized by the kind of asymmetric capabilities that China has, like anti-ship ballistic missiles um, or satellite killer missiles and satellite killer satellites. So they basically checkmated us already without even us realizing it mm. militarily. And they're going to do whatever they, they want to do, and we're not going to be able to do much about it even though we outspend them still like five to one. Yeah. That's an interesting uh, read on it. The reason I ask is because I've been kind of thinking about this recently. I had, I had a long discussion with my buddy, Jonathan Havercroft the other day about this. And uh, he seemed, he, he's, he's kind of quite worried about the potential for uh, military conflict uh, between the United States and, and China. Um, 
And it is interesting, I mean, what's going on in the, in the South China Sea, <clears throat> because there is, I mean, the United States does have a lot of uh, military power over there. And if you look at like a map of kind of U.S. naval and military presence, uh, there's like the, a lot of bases kind of right around China. Uh, there's like a massive naval presence. The U S has a massive naval presence over there. Um, and you know, with China's kind of revisionist, uh, policies on the, the, the territories that they want back and all of that, it does seem to be like a pretty, a potentially pretty explosive situation. Um, but on the other hand, I, what I was saying to Jonathan, which I wasn't really able to articulate because I was just kind of going off big intuitions, but, it seems to me that uh, China is playing a different kind of game. And, and you basically kind of just put into words sort of what I was thinking, which is it just seems to me that um, China will likely rise to dominance in a, in a bloodless way. Uh, because it seems to me, and this is kind of like a, a kind of insight from what you call sort of neoliberal institutionalism and international relations, is that, you know, the gains from trade have become so much more substantial and the, with the international linkages uh, becoming so much more dense and substantial at a certain point uh, going to war doesn't make sense. And actually uh, people would rather just negotiate these types of things. Yeah, I think that's right. It's, it's, I don't see a big, you know, explosive military conflict. I just see a gradual shift of power where the U S and the EU realize we, we can't really dictate terms Mm -hmm. to China in any any meaningful way. And mm -hmm. um, they're investing in exactly the kinds of things that are going to be hard to fight against. Like their cyber warfare investment is huge because they realize that like, if they shut down the internet in the U.S., we can have all the nukes we want, but it won't, it won't matter much. And they're also investing hugely, I think, in what they call biopower, which is a form of soft power that concerns the kind of quality of their population. So I think they're poised to take advantage of new molecular genetic technologies for doing things like embryo screening and developing, you know, the next generations of babies who have certain um, mental traits that will be valuable. The uptake of that will be much faster and broader in China than anywhere else. And within a generation or two, it means unless we do the same, we just won't be at all competitive cognitively. Hmm. Super fascinating. Well, it seems a fait accompli, right? Because the the kind of cultural hurdles in the West seem so kind of substantial and inert that it's hard. I mean, it's very hard to imagine a scenario in which uh, the West becomes as fluid and as willing to uh, really tackle these challenges as China is. Yeah, we won't notice until it's kind of too late. I mean, we might not notice until, say, 2040 or 50 when the first generation of kids who are sort of conceived and brought up using these technologies start to be 70 or 80 percent of all the Ivy League incoming class. Hmm. And then we'll go, what happened there? Uh, right. You know, that's an interesting point also, because with globalization, the, the, the nation state kind of makes less and less a difference. It's sort of obvious, right? But it plays out in interesting ways when you think about sort of education, right? Like if, if, if China's rise to dominance is through like American uh, elite uh, educational institutions, for instance, it's sort of, uh, that makes it even harder to imagine a kind of like old school uh, kind of confrontation between the United States and China, right? Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of, the you know the elite in China now who have gone to grad school in America or Europe, who hopefully have fond memories of their time and and aren't don't really see themselves as as enemies. It's just you know they they came here and learned what they needed to learn, went back and run their societies. Um. So it's not that they want you know China to just wipe everybody else out into some kind of old school, you know, Persian versus Spartan thing. But um, I think the mindset will be America and Europe are just kind of losers <laughs> and they blew it and they could have kept up, but they just, 
got distracted by the virtue signaling and the social justice activism and the political correctness and bad policies and also bad forms of government right. that don't actually work in the 21st century. Yeah, that's, that's super fascinating. Um, and it, it kind of seems to me that like most uh, Washington politicians sort of don't care that much in the sense that I think the contemporary kind of ruling class in the United States and Western Europe, um, it's just kind of in a holding pattern where they want to kind of maintain stability. They want their privileges. They, you know, they want to, they want their own money and power or whatever, but it's like, it seems to me that there is a, a real thing going on where the ruling classes in the West kind of genuinely are detached from most of the kind of like poor and working people in the countries so, like, the actual fate of the large mass of human beings in a nation state actually matters very little to uh, the, the rulers of Western Europe and the United States. So it's like, and I think this is kind of like what the, like the multicultural kind of, like, uh, sensitive um, modern politician is. It's like, um, they seem like they, like, care more about people than the average old politician of old. But it's actually a really cultivated kind of uh, uh, insensitivity to them. Whereas, like, I, you know, I, you see someone like Steve Bannon, and I mean, I don't, I don't like Steve Bannon in any way, really. Like, I, I, I couldn't think of something I, about him that I actually like. Um, but it seems to me this is the type of person who actually really cares about the fate of, like, poor white people in the United States. And if you actually do care, it's, in, it's just interesting to see how that plays out, because... Well, I don't necessarily support his policies or wh- what he's trying to do. It does seem that, like, if you actually care about, like, poor white people in America or something like that, you actually do start to see China as, like, a threat. Um, and you actually do kind of want to get tough. Mm-hmm. Because on some level, it is, there is, like, existential conflict at, at, at bay um, or, you know, at, at risk um, in some sense at some point down the line. Um, because I think people like Bannon and Trump see the kinds of things that you're saying and they're kind of like, we actually need someone to like step up and do something about this. Um, so I just think it's very fascinating because it's like the, the modern politician seems like they care about everyone. That's like their whole image. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the dirty little secret is, is like, they're fully down for just global capitalism, their own kind of current comfort in the current dynamic. And they're more than happy to let China kind of like, uh, put Western Europe and China and and the United States uh, behind them. And and you know what I mean? Um, Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm sure politicians never really cared that much about the people, but at least they kind of gave lip service to it sometimes. Hmm. And I think the degree to which, you know, the Washington political elite has ignored working class white America the last 30 years is, is tragic and bizarre and, um, kind of treasonous. I don't think Trump actually cares that much, but I think he realized he could position himself in a way that at least pretended to care and at least took the concerns of those people seriously. And it's it's just the exact opposite of the intersectional sort of grievance uh, lists. Right. It's, it's, oh my gosh, even if you don't, have any of these grievance identities, you still matter. And um, I don't think that movement is done playing out. I think it's only just beginning. And mm-hmm. I think it'll be fascinating to see um, when there's a new generation of, of political leaders and thinkers who actually take the interests of the majority of their citizens more seriously, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I'd be curious, like, what the average leftist would say if you really kind of put to them, like, the scenario that you kind of just described of what the, the future of global politics and economics might look like. It basically kind of implies that at a certain point, American, uneducated American workers will be the equivalent of, like, the, the poor, you know, uh, South Asian uh, sweatshop worker mm-hmm. at, at some point, potentially. Um, that, that could actually happen. Um, and, it, and it's yeah. like, what does the, like, <clears throat> uh, what does a contemporary leftist say about that? If you like care about the worker, like if you care about like workers everywhere, 
you kind of have to care about like the United States not being destroyed economically by a, another superpower because yeah. it's going to look real bad for a lot of people in the U.S. So it's like it's interesting how how can a leftist politics like kind of take that seriously? Well, yeah, I I hardly ever hear leftists talk about the state of like working class white people at all. Um, and you know the irony there is. I thought about this when there were the Berkeley riots and the, the Antifas versus the, the sort of Milo Yiannopoulos supporters. And some of the Antifa spokespeople were saying, we're, we're going to shut this down. We're going to you know, obliterate the alt-right. And the Trump supporters and the alt-right people there you know, were fighting back. And um, then there was a lot of discussion on social media about, well, who's going to win, the social justice activists or the you know, the white nationalists, basically. And I thought, well, okay, like, I'm familiar with gun culture. I'm from the Midwest. There are 300 million guns in America in a population of 350 million. How many of those are owned by social justice activists? <laughs> like 10? I don't know. If the shit hits the fan and there's actual... Um, mass violence, um, it's obvious who's going to win. The rural, right. the rural white Americans are going right. to win. They're not going to put up with becoming locked into sweatshops. There's going to be right. a revolution. It's just not going to be an intersectional revolution. Yeah. It's going to be the opposite. And uh, it's hard to predict how that'll go, but I think it's kind of like when I talked about you know, if, if the economic level of description is confusing, drop down to the Darwinian level of description. Well, if the economic level of description is confusing, drop down to the who actually has military power mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. Where are the guns? Mm -hmm. who, who is the military really uh, allied with? Who, who do the police really sympathize with? 